Hi, I'm Steve from Brownells, and with me today I have a special panel. I've got Tank Hoover, famous gun writer. <laughs> I've got Bobby Tyler, famous gunsmith from Tyler Gunworks. And I've got Mike Barante, the premier leather maker in the USA. And we're here because we're talking about Elmer Keith and what he did for the world of firearms. Guys, I'm going to open it right up. We got the number five here in front of us, the last word came out all those years ago and we're still talking about it. Why? If it's broke, if it's not broke, don't fix it. Pretty close Great to perfection. There's a... It's important to say that Elmer took his number five, he wanted to give it to Colt so that they could start building a similar gun with adjustable sights, with the type of mainspring that he used. He, he thought this was an evolution of the six gun that would have just taken the industry through the roof for, for hand gunners and Colt ignored them up until they finally came out with the new frontier but by then Bill Ruger had stepped up and started making his uh, his flat top 357 and finally the 44 the Magnum when it right. came out. Ruger was in the right place with the right design at the Absolutely. right time. And Colt has a history of turning down good ideas, like the Roland White patent, or bored through cylinders, <laughs> things like that. So they, they missed the train a couple of times. I think also the number five uh, exemplifies what can be done with a custom gun. It just opened the doors to guys who wanted something different than what factories offered. And gunsmiths like Bobby Tyler here continues that process with the work he does. I think it's important to know that when you're looking at this revolver, this isn't a 10 or 15 yard revolver. This is a revolver capable of shooting large distances uh, very easily a 100 yard gun. And when we build one of these, which we mimic them often, I mean this is the platform to build off of. It's what, it's what the guys want. Sure. It's, yeah. And like I said, if it's not broke, don't fix it. So what well, we take, we make small modifications to suit a customer's needs. Uh, and, you know, there, there's just different things you can do, but the root goes right back into this revolver. And to Elmer's passion for sure. the industry. Yeah, I mean, we can look at Elmer Keith and just about anything that's done in the handgun industry today you could trace its roots back to Elmer Keith, whether it's sights on a gun, cartridge development, um, uh, hunting with a handgun. That's all stuff that Elmer did. So you know, a lot of what we do today is just built on his shoulders. Handgun hunting was not a big thing back then. No. It was just something you had on your hip, and if you got an opportunity to get something yeah. to eat that night, you know, you that, shot it. That's a great point, Steve, because Elmer wasn't strictly a handgun hunter. He, he always had a six gun on his side and he said he, it was there for targets of opportunity and, right. and also exactly. for protection. I mean, several times it saved his life. Or one time he was, uh, I guess he was trying to rope a steer or something and he got knocked off his horse and, and the bull was coming after him and, and he shot and killed the bull because mm. he had a six gun on his side. Yeah, um, plus that famous shot he did, that 600 yard shot, he only did it because all he had was a six gun. The guy with the rifle ran out of ammo, if I remember that's right. That's correct. Mm -hmm. So that's why he had to take that shot. And I know a lot of people disputed that, but from everything I've read and statements from people who have seen him shoot, they say without a doubt, they have no doubts that, that shot, those shots occurred the way they did. I think Elmer must have had really good eyesight because he could see where his bullets were hitting when he missed and make the correction. And yeah. that's half the trick right there. You know, everybody has special talents, and I, I believe Elmer was just, like you said, blessed with wonderful eyesight and obviously great hand-eye coordination. And, you know, going back with the development of the number five, when Harold Croft came out to visit him, I think he was skeptical from reading Elmer's writings with his long-range shootings, and I think he wanted to catch him in some exaggerations. and. When Sedgley finally got to Oregon from Pennsylvania, he brought his four guns, and one of the first things Elmer did was he had a piece of wood four foot by four foot, and he rode out 700 yards from his cabin, 
and he sat down by a tree and he started shooting Harold Croft's guns and he hit it with every gun and the last gun he shot was a two inch barrel slip gun and it took him I believe two cylinder fulls to finally hit the board and if I remember correctly he said he was aiming like 20 feet up and to the left <laughs> in a shrub but he lobbed those rounds right in and and Harold Croft became a believer. 700 yards, you know how small four feet looks oh at 700 gosh, yards? Yep. That is a tiny target. Yeah. Oh. If, you know, if you don't know what a slip gun is, there's no trigger. You pull the hammer back and let go and the gun goes off. That's how, that's how a slip gun works. And it's meant for close up range defensive shooting. And Elmer was able to hit the four by four target at 700 yards with that gun. There's no trigger control. I mean, right. it's, it's no. a very this, hard uh, revolver to be accurate with at any distance. So and that's, that's just a statement impressive. with his hand-eye coordination and, yeah. and just timing and everything, just absolutely unbelievable. And this was at a time when people thought of handguns as strictly a short range short. proposition. Yeah. 50 yards would have been the long oh, shot that'd be a for, long for shot. just about yeah. anybody. So when you talk about the, the time period of when this revolver was built and the, the brainchild that was behind it and how they came about it, you want to talk about craftsmen. Uh, guys, can you all imagine, you know, we have gunsmiths today, we have uh, parts fitters, we have gunsmiths, and we have true craftsmen. Mm -hmm. They can take and, you know, when you're in the middle of any build, it doesn't matter uh, what it is, there's always things that come up. But say you hit something and it's just something you don't know how to do, well, you figure it out, you fix it, you, you adapt. And we have milling machines, lathes, uh, I mean, equipment that is beyond measure. These guys did not have all that. They had some, some equipment, I'm sure, but the, the amount of craftsmanship that went into building something like this, with what they had to build it with, it impresses the heck out of me. And we're talking yes. 1928, 1929. Yeah. Elmer didn't have a telephone in his cabin out in Durkee. Yeah. He didn't so have electricity. Didn't have electricity. Just had lanterns. Yeah. These fellows are, are spread out across the country working on this gun. How did they communicate with him? And the short amount of time they got this thing turned around, it's just mind boggling. Sure. No FedEx, no UPS. Right. Yeah, right. No correspondence. Yeah. Move the mail. parts to the, the different gunsmiths that worked on it. Right. Seriously. That thing went by train back and forth, I'm sure. Yeah. Right, hmm. right. Along with a letter describing what he wanted. So the turnaround time was amazing from the time Croft visited him to the time the article came out in American Rifleman. I mean, that's, that's a I mean, tight it's, timeline. It's not like they were at Colt where they were set up. You know, it was a custom revolver built and fitted. And, and what I assume they did is they probably went in, uh, fit the barrel and balanced the cylinder. And then you basically start at one end and go to the next, working through the fine details, working through the machining, the, the marking and the machining for the, for the latch that locks the base pin. Mm -hmm. That's a pretty in-depth uh, machining process. Even to set it up, set a woodruff cutter up, cut that slot, that's a fairly in-depth cut and my guess is, back in this time frame, I bet they cut it by hand. Really? Yeah. Wow. Yep. I mean, you, when you weld on a gun today, you're using do TIG. TIG. TIG welding yeah. Most doesn't your, heat the gun up as much, so you're 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 keeping yeah. the heat to a small area so you don't distort the frame. This would have been in the days way prior to anything similar to TIG, and. Um, I don't know anything about welding, but I could imagine that that was a, a major feat to do what they did with Absolutely. that top with strap, that top strap. Oh. Yeah. welding on that chunk of steel and then blending everything in and you can't tell that it was welded. It looks yeah. like They would have used a, probably an oxyacetylene torch and I'll bet half that frame was glowing red hot and then the, the welded part was white hot. Yep. So it was put through fire. So and, and they still kept it straight. Something yeah. that strikes me funny a while ago, you were talking about Elmer not having electricity or anything. So can you imagine him getting off a day's work, walking in the house with no electricity, no, no uh, anonymities to speak of with an engraved, uh, right. Right. Engraved right. Right. on his side. That's priorities, well, no. right? And here's right. something. Yep. 
the number five was developed and it was his brainchild. There was nothing for him to copy off of or mimic. And he, he came up with that. Yeah. And he was just never satisfied. He was always striving for the best gun, the best load, the best bullet. I mean, how many cast bullet designs did he have? You know, yeah. they could, numerous. You know, the, the whole Keith bullet, you know, from 358, 45, the 44s, he's got one for 41. And he's got numerous designs. He was just really something else. Well, in my opinion, he did it. You know, you'll, you'll hear people talk about master gunsmiths and master this and master that. The day he took his last breath, he did become a master sportsman, you know, and, and he, yeah. he sealed the deal. And in my opinion, that's when you become a master, when you're no longer a study of the art. That's one of the things that really made me appreciate him was, you know, you talk about the famous gun writers and stuff, and they all went on guided hunts. Well, Elmer was the guide. He's the guy that <laughs> exactly. took them. He's the one he that knew how to pack the animals out. He knew how to track them down, set up camp, cook the food. He did it all. Mm -hmm. And then he, I think he said when he reached the age of 50, he had enough of it and he was going to start enjoying <laughs> life and going on a guide and hunts himself. But, mm -hmm. you know, up until that time, that, that, that's what he did. He spent six months out of the year away, you know, guiding hunters. Mm. One more thing that... Uh, we mentioned us guys talking earlier, and I definitely wanted to mention. Um, so it is engraved, and it's period engraved. When you when you talk about or hear someone mention a period engraved gun, this is what you expect. I mean, this is what I can close my eyes and see a period engraved gun, and this is the gun I see. Mm -hmm. You know, and we've got uh, some others that are similarly engraved, but. One of the things that you want to think about, when you think about engraving today, uh, I brought some guns that were influenced by this gun that we've recently built. Uh, one of them we did engrave, and we, we put our spin on what we were trying to build. Uh, there's different parts in the market, uh, different pieces. We went with the Ronnie Wells grip frame, we, you know, uh, the Furman Garza mirrored gold bead front sight. I mean, we balanced it ourselves to fit what we're trying to build. But the engraving on this is done under a microscope, uh, high magnification. Uh, it's still hand engraved. You know, an artist draws it on there. He takes a, a, a mark and pen and physically draws the engraving on and cuts it, backgrounds it. It's not laser, it's, it's real engraving. Mm -hmm. But it is done under exact magnification and so Every scroll is perfect. Every background dot is in place. There's no room for error because it's right there in front of you. Now these, back, back in this time frame, if they had anything, if they had a visor, they would have been a high class engraver. Yeah, wow. And as you know, a visor is minimal magnification. Yeah. Right. Some of the old time guys used to checker wood stocks without any magnification too, yeah. and I don't see how you could do it. <laughs> so I would guess that this one was either done with no magnification or uh, a visor type magnification. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just unbelievable to me where things come from and where they go. You go back to your, your Nimsky type engraving uh, and go back to, the, to the, the base and the root of engraving and you'll discover the different chapters in how any art follows. How it, it, I mean, it this is something that should sure. ring pretty close to your heart. Oh, sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you see it in leather and the, and the different types of tooling and um, even you know, production gun leather. This, this holster that went with Elmer's gun here was a George Lawrence Company uh, 120 model and that holster was probably built in the late 1920s. And uh, the shape of that holster, if you compare that with, say, Skeeter Skelton's 120 holster from the 1960s, they don't even look like the same holster. The contour of the main seam is a little bit different. The top is cut a little bit different because uh, by 1960 we had adjustable sights on guns. So, so everything evolves. Uh, as Bobby said, the, the engraving, early engraving was, was standard. I mean, that is probably the, the style of engraving that you would see on any gun from the 1920s. And as, as uh, time moves on, 
skill level changes, improves, and, and we end up with what we have today, as Bobby uh, has shown us here. You know, Bobby, I have a question for you. We've heard that the number five's been re two or three times at least. How can you, do you have to polish it to remove the balloon without messing up the engraving, or how's that done? So that's a great question, and I'm going to attack it from the way I would do it. Okay. Um, and I'm sure even back in these times, they could have taken a, a lye type chemical, something to remove the blue. Right. Okay. So Chemically what I would do done. is I would carefully disassemble, uh, separate my internal parts from my external parts. That's what I do on everything. I say, you know, these, these get blued, these don't. And I would chemically remove the blue. And then I would take a hand polish stick and go in anywhere that needed feathered, needed head up, maybe we got a ding and I would just polish around the engraving. Right. Because say, say you go in and, and do what you call polish. Say you send this to Bubba's garage to have it re -blued. Normally what they'll do is they'll, they'll take part of it apart, take it to a buffing wheel, and buff it until the bluing's gone. And along then, with half your engraving. Along with, along with every, <laughs> All every, every corner, uh, every short, sharp corner, yeah. where mm -hmm. a corner meets around. And then Bubba will get it over to the bluing tank and he'll get it blued. And then he'll put the rest of it back together, and that's what I call a re-blue. That's why people will call me and they'll say, uh, do you re-blue guns? And I say, well, we, we restore them. We put them back the way they're supposed to be. And that, that's as, as important as, does this top strap need to be polished this way? Or does it need to be polished, you know, uh, vertical or horizontal? Uh, does the barrel, does it blend lengthways? Or do you uh, shoe shine it? Right. Hand polish it all the way out to the end. And it's just little things like that that either capture the the true presence of the the condition and the restoration or they ruin it. Right. right. And so I'm gonna go out on a limb and say, I have examined this very well and there's never been Bubba's never blew this gun. No, I, it, it the engraving yeah. is just sharp, it's immaculate. It's, for the the amount of history and the for what this this means to me personally, it's it's a piece of history that could never be replaced. I guess it's like my dentist says, when he went to medical school, somebody graduated number one and somebody graduated number seven hundred and thirteen, but they're all called doctor. And same thing goes with gunsmiths. Yeah. So I think yeah. you hang that yeah. shingle up. You got good ones, yeah. you got bad ones. That's so. a fact. I heard that when he took delivery of this gun at first, it wasn't even engraved. Is that true? I I heard that as well. I, yeah. We were talking about that earlier, and yeah, you know, the early photos from uh, the magazine article. It was mm -hmm. not an engraved gun. He got it. He he wanted to make sure the gun shot, oh, and that it was him. worthy of engraving. And uh, before before he did that, and the and the stocks weren't the carved ivory that are on there now. That brings up a whole other topic. So there's a big difference in a beautiful gun and a beautifully built, balanced, functional gun. So for me, it starts on the inside. Mm -hmm. If it doesn't function flawlessly, if the timing's not right, if the sights are not set up properly, say you've got a wrong front sight, uh, wrong front height sight to go with your rear. Um, you've got a grip panel that's uh, bug in your hand or you've got a sharp spot I call them hot spots mm -hmm. you got a hot spot anywhere you know it real quick right and so to me that was that's what I do that was ideal you go through you build the gun you build the perfect revolver that you can sh out shoot anything that you want to shoot realistically the revolver should shoot better than the human shooting it in my case and that's always for me it sure you know we build revolvers that out shoot us mm -hmm. and then you can look at perfect fit uh, finish, uh, engraving, you know, small details about, you know, the front sight, how the front sight has the finish put and the polish is right. But if it's not functionally built, sight set up, the grip set up, the timing, the hammer, you know, the drop, the trigger pull, you know, whether there's any over travel, then you're wasting your time with, with the ornamental part. Sure, sure. So, yeah, there, there's, you can, well, you mentioned it earlier where you've got guys that are assemblers, you've got, cra and the, the, 
the epitome, of course, is the craftsman who can do it all and make it not just look good or not just function, but it's a combination of all, all those pieces. And I think that's, well, you called it the last word. And that's, yeah. that's it right there. It is the last word. That, that is everything put together from, from start to finish in, in a truly functional work of art. And that's, uh, it's something to see still carried on today in outfits like Tyler Gunn works here. That's, you want something that doesn't just look pretty. You want something that's going to function and last for, for years. Years. Yeah. There, I mean, Coming how, up how on could you find, years yeah, close, how could yeah. you find a better example sure. to talk about this platform mm -hmm. and to talk about build it right and it'll go the distance. Right. Something that's the catalyst of so many other custom guns. Mm -hmm. Just, I think the the Lawrence holster that went with that is an example of the same the same uh, outcome that that you want for all your products that holster was used from the start with that gun and here we are you know that would have been 1929 so now here we are in 2021 that holster is still in perfect condition, and he used that daily for, what, close to 30 years until we got his 44 Magnum as a daily carry gun and, and uh, holster. And look at the condition of that holster there. That is yeah. still, that's... Looks like it that, came off the shelf. Exactly, and it's still functional today, and, and you compare that with some other holsters that are in collections that, that were built in the same time period, and you wouldn't want to stick a gun at them for fear of either the holster crumbling. And that, that has to do with how it was taken care of over the years. But it also is a, a testament to the quality that... Well, uh, there's obviously, there was nothing wrong with the pattern. If, I mean, if you're still building them today... Right. And it's virtually... Uh, other than small uh, changes you made for, like, sights... With, right. with modifications like you talked about earlier with the with the top changing uh, taper or whatnot. If it's not broke, don't fix it. Sure. So. Yeah. I, I wanted, this is my number five holster, I wanted it to be a, a recreation of the original Lawrence that Elmer used and um, and I offer it in plain or, or uh, carving uh, similar to the original and um, just because that means so much to me, that holster and that gun. I wanted to carry that on just as you're doing with your guns. Yeah. You know, it, it, it occurs to me that the single action revolver is probably the best platform you could possibly ask for to showcase the talents of a craftsman. Because you have to have beauty, you have to have the technology, you know, the tolerances, and there's so much you can do to a single action that you might not be able to do to, like one of my beloved Smith & Wessons, you can only do so much to a double action, but to a single action, the sky's the limit. And you add to it their, their versatility and being able to handle the stronger calibers, right. their durability, uh, I mean, they just, you can't wear one out. Oh, especially if you start like with a root, just a basic Ruger yep, and absolutely. doll it all up, uh, you, your grandkids won't wear that gun out. As a, as a student of the revolver myself, I, I challenge everybody to learn about the revolver, learn about the history, learn about Elmer Keith. These, these are things that, you know, it's free to learn off other people's knowledge, knowledge, yeah. knowledge and is mistakes, free. Yeah. you yeah. know, uh, yeah. versus going out and doing it yourself. Educate yourself. Uh, know about Elmer Keith. Know build, about Skeeter Skelton. Build a foundation, because you know, Elmer, right. Elmer started it, that's for sure. That's as fine a hunting tool as a handgun hunter could have. As many good automatics are out there. A nice double action, still the single action kind of rules, for, at least as far as I'm concerned. Well, it's funny. Single actions, uh, you think of them as being archaic mm -hmm. from another time that don't have a use other than hunting. But uh, I sell a um, concealment holster that the majority of my orders are for single action revolvers. That's how popular the single action is. I've got guys buying concealment holsters just to carry their gun and, and uh, 
it shows not only um, how important revolvers still are to people, but how important the single action revolver is. It's still thought of today as something that people weren't afraid to defend their life with. Right, and it's a good tool for the guy that's going to use it hard, like sure. Elmer did yeah. back yeah. in the day. I don't know if you remember the last time I was actually out here and we visited, we talked about the revolver being the 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 gun of the year, yeah. and being the, yeah. you know, you, you go through phases where certain uh, firearms reach certain popularities, and revolvers to me right now are on an all-time high, and the popularity of them, we do have people pursuing and, and chasing, and, you know, they want to have that next nice custom revolver. Right. Right, you know, and and before you get all upset, we all love well-fitted 1911s. Yeah. Um, you know, I have a collection of Smith and Wessons from here to Sunday, um, but these single actions, I just keep coming back to them. They're just fascinating. Yeah. Well, since we have a group of experts here, I'm going to ask the question: What effect do you guys think that Elmer Keith actually had on the industry? What's his legacy? What's he left us with? Uh, first, to say to before um, that there isn't much done in the handgun world today, whether it's in the industry or as individuals that can't be traced back to Elmer Keith, long range handgun shooting, Elmer Keith, um, loading him up to, uh, to be able to take big game, Elmer Keith. The sighting systems on guns today, Elmer Keith. They were still fixed sight guns whenever he started playing around with, the, with his number five. Um, as far as gun leather goes, uh, something like his Lawrence holster that's going to last and, and do the job and, uh, and still be functional today, almost 100 years later, is uh, it, it just his, uh, his input on, on what his requirements were for gun leather has been something that's guided me and what I want to build in my shop. I'm going to take this. I mean, you could spin this question uh, a jillion ways, and we could talk about it the rest of the day. I'm going to approach it from a design and a technical standpoint from what I do. Uh, as you can see, we build a revolver that's so highly influenced by it. Mm -hmm. um, the one thing that I want you to notice is some of the small features that you look at it and you don't think much of, uh, such as the grip, the grip frame shape, it's designed to recoil and drop right back on your sight picture. And then you've got your sights. You, the sights are designed to have a good clear sight picture and to be used at long ranges. Right. And so, so many of the pieces, so I'm sure Elmer got tired of picking up his cylinder pin. <laughs> yeah. He got tired of reaching up and hitting yeah. that hammer and it going into half battery and saying, oh crud, where's my cylinder pin? <laughs> and so I don't imagine he had a drawer inside his shop to go in there and grab another cylinder Probably pin. Probably not. Like we do. And so all these little things, uh, let's call them little things, all these little things go together, just one piece of the puzzle at a time, to make up the perfect design and balance. And without this design, I feel like we would still be uh, ages behind. Probably right, probably right. I know as a writer, um, we're always trying to keep fresh new material coming up, but everything seems to spin back around down to Elmer. If you read Six Guns or Hell I Was There, any topic in the gun world, like Mike said, you know, like particularly sights, from shooting experience, shooting long distance, Elmer liked the flat front sight because he said it was easier to hold elevation. When you look at a round sight, you have just a small arc to actually place on the target as opposed to the full width of a flat blade. I mean, simple things like that. And uh, I, I think it's important. I always try to periodically throw something in with Elmer and it might drive the editors a little crazy, but I personally think it's important. I think the young guys need to know about Elmer, where this stuff came from, and uh, you just can't go wrong. I mean, it, it, another old saying is, you know, what gun writers say today, it's, it's all been regurgitated by Elmer long ago, and I hate to say it, but you think you're writing something fresh when you go back and start digging around, you're like, son of a gun, Elmer wrote about this, you know, 60 years ago. And, you know, 
What else can you say? The man was a legend. I think, uh, you know, the fact that Hamilton Bowen, the guy that wrote the book on custom revolvers, when he was looking for something to put on the cover, he put his copy of the number five on there because that design influenced everything he did Spoke as well. for itself. Yeah. 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 Enough so said. We're still yeah. living with the stuff he figured out all those years ago, and it still works. Along with the cartridges he, you know, improved and developed, and the bullets. I mean, he gave us a lot. He really did. And we haven't even covered c rifle cartridges or the... No, that's a whole <laughs> nother, a whole nother <laughs> can of worms. Because he didn't just, you know, go out there with handguns and blaze away. He was big into rifles and yep. designing cartridges. And he had a double rifle or two for his safaris. I mean, he was, and he was a shotgunner. Yep. yep. Anything that could bring meat to the table, he was interested in it. Sportsman. Right, right, a, a sportsman. True sportsman. He was. A gentleman sportsman. Yeah, That's yeah. Guys, I'd like to thank you all for coming today. I really learned a lot and I enjoyed our discussion. And thank you all for watching. If you have any comments or questions, please leave them below. We'd like to hear from you. Special thanks to Rock Island Auction House for letting us borrow the Keith number five. And with that, that's the last word. <laughs>